Have you ever wondered what it would be like if other people could hear your thoughts? If they could hear your worries, your anxieties? If they, could, if they knew all of the things that were going on in your head? Today, we're just kind of going to continue our study in, in the book of Philippians chapter 4. And, and we're going to talk about this topic of, of worry. We're going to talk about this topic of anxiety. And before we get there, I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page. And just be able to honestly say... We are all worried. <laughs> we are all anxious right now. And I love that we've been going through the study together in Philippians chapter 4, which has almost been as if it's so relevant to our lives. It's, it's almost like instead of writing this 2,000 years ago to a church on the other side of the world, it's almost like Paul is writing this directly to people in our world, directly to people in our situation here in 2020. And before he closes out his letter, as we're wrapping up the book of Philippians, he says, hey, I, I can't end this without talking to you about worry and anxiety. I can't finish this letter up without addressing this topic. And it's like he knows where we are. If you would, open up your Bibles to the book of Philippians. We're going to continue where we left off last week. Actually, we're going to continue a little bit above that. Uh, last week we, we were reading through chapter 4 and I think we got all the way through verse 5. And this week we're just going to continue at chapter 4 verse 4 and go through verse 9. Read with me if you would. Open your Bibles up to the book of Philippians and let's continue in our reading. And Paul writes this. Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, in prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, if anything, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. And whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put that into practice, and the peace of God will be with you. Right now, according to the Journal of Medicine, 60% of all physician visits are actually due to stress-related disorders, which means the, the largest portion of our, of our medical concerns is not about what we are eating. It's about what's eating us. It's about our worries and our fears and our anxieties. And let's be honest that we all have these. And so today, I simply want to talk about what do you do about worry? What do you do about anxiety? How do you rejoice in the Lord and have this peace? Because God is calling us to be a people of peace. He's calling us to be a people of joy. And one of the greatest things that will steal your joy and your peace from you in this life is worry. It is that fear, it is that anxiety. And it's almost like Paul knew what we would be going through in this moment, especially now, because this is what's happening. Let's be honest, we are all anxious about the future. We don't know anything that is going to be happening in the future. And we're trying to plan for the future, and we don't know if it's going to happen. And then we plan things, and things get canceled. And then we grieve that which we've lost, like normalcy, like friendships, like community. And, and when you grieve, anxiety builds up within you. Anxiety, grief leads to anxiety. And in the midst of all of this, we're told that, hey, there's this, this virus and there's this thing that you cannot see and you cannot fight, yet it triggers this ancient thing that God built into us in our biology, this adrenaline, this fight or flight reaction. And yet there's nothing we can fight and there's nowhere we can run. And so we don't know what to do and the anxiety just builds up within us and worry comes out. And then it begins to spill over into other areas of our life and we don't know what to do. And so you take all of that, pent up, that, that pent up frustration and it begins to spill over onto other people, usually on Facebook. That's just what's happening today in our culture, in our society. And, and this worry and this anxiety is eating people alive. And so today, Paul's going to address, what do you do about your worry? And we call this title, How Do You Worry Well? Because I want to be very clear. I don't want this to be some kind of drive-by guilting and say, you shouldn't be worried, you shouldn't be anxious, because there's a lot to be anxious about. Like, we do not know what the future holds. There's a lot to worry about. And so in this, I want to be very clear. God is not saying, do not worry. Instead, we're going to talk about how do you worry well? What does it look like to still have peace and to have joy in the midst of worry? How do we walk through this together well? Because I want to let you know, worry and grief and anxiety, they're not wrong. And we'll get into that further on. 
Because God is going to be very clear. Jesus is not going to say, don't worry. He's going to say, today's worries are enough for you. Don't worry about tomorrow. Because there's so much going on today that you have to worry about already. And he's not saying that worry or grief or anxiety are wrong. Because I want to let you know, it's a daily plague of our life. Worry and anxiety. Not just in 2020, but it's a daily plague that we go through. And how do you do that well? Because you should be anxious about certain things in the future. You should grieve and be angry about the brokenness of our world. How do you do that with joy and peace of God in your life? And today Paul's going to walk us through how to do that. Last week we read Philippians chapter 4, verse 4, where he says, Rejoice in the Lord. I will say it again, rejoice. And it's this idea that rejoice is a command. And doubly emphasized, and after we got through teaching that last week, someone came up to me. He said, so you're saying that it's a moral obligation to pursue joy. And I'm like, wow, that is so beautiful. And I want to be clear, there's a difference in pursuing joy and pursuing happiness. Pursuing happiness is this idea of pursuing pleasure. And that's what we call hedonism. Hedonism is where you just seek out whatever makes you happy in the moment. And the problem with hedonism is it's a drug. Basically, you are pursuing larger and larger sources of pleasure, and eventually that pleasure will not fulfill you in the way that it did before. And so you seek out larger and larger sources of pleasure, and hedonism will lead you to an empty well, but joy is of the Lord. And the command here is to pursue joy, rejoice in the Lord. So how do we chase joy? How do we find peace when we have to go through worry and anxiety to get there? And so Paul will give us three basic steps. Actually, before we do that, Paul's going to walk us on this short tutorial of how to find joy in God, how to find peace in God in the midst of worry. But before we do that, I, I do want to define some words. Webster's Dictionary defines worry as to treat roughly, a tearing apart or a continual biting. It's this idea that you would just like wring out your clothes until they were worn and there was nothing left of them. The example in Webster's Dictionary is actually a dog worrying a bone. And I read that and I thought, a dog worrying a bone? It's like the bone worried that the dog's going to eat it or something? No, no, no. It's referring to this gnawing on or eating and this gradual wearing away of things. That's what worrying is. And it's saying worrying has that effect on your life. It's a gnawing inside of you. Isn't that what it feels like when you're anxious? Isn't that what it feels like when you, when you don't know what's going to happen and you're worried about something? It just begins to eat. We use the phrase, it eats away at me. And that's the illustration that even Webster's Dictionary gives. He's like a dog worrying a bone. It's a tearing apart. The other definition I want you to know is this definition of peace. The word peace, according to Webster's Dictionary, is to bring unity or harmony. It's to bring a calm, quiet See, there's this contrast about what we're supposed to have and, and what there is in life. And God says, listen, worry is going to tear you apart, but my peace will hold you together. It's why you need to be able to pursue my joy and know my peace in the midst of your worry. Because you have to be armed against all of the things that are going to scare you in life and all of the anxiety and frustration. And so how do we find joy and peace through our worry. And the first thing Paul mentions is prayer. In verse 6 he says this, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request before the Lord. If you would, in your Bible, uh, do me a favor on, in verse 6 where it says, Do not be anxious. Circle the word be in there. It says, Do not be anxious. You see, I want you to know there's a difference in having anxiety or having worry and being a worried person. See, you are called to be, meaning you have your identity wrapped up in it. You're called to be a person of peace. You're called to be a person of joy. It doesn't mean you won't be affected by worry. It doesn't mean you won't be affected by anxiety. But that should not be where your identity is wrapped up in. You see, he's telling us, not, don't, like, he's not saying if you ever worry about something, that, that, that's a sin. Because that's just human. But he said, you should not let that become who you are because your identity should be so wrapped up in God's joy and God's peace and worry will steal your joy. And then he says, do not be anxious about anything. I have anything underlined in my Bible. And I'm like, really? That's easier said than done. Do not be anxious about anything? I'm like, I'm anxious about everything. What, what am I supposed to be? And I think that's why it's so key to underline that be. And then he says, in every situation. So how do we not be an anxious person. And he says, here's the key. 
in every situation, what situation are you in now? What situation is going to come at you in the future? And he says, I want you to present your requests before the Lord. You simply set it and place it at the feet of God and leave it there. You see, one of the things that people used to have that I, I wonder if we've lost some of the understanding of, when they presented a gift to the Lord, they would actually bring it to the altar. It's one of the reasons we have our joy boxes at the front of the sanctuary, simply to say, listen, we want for you to have the symbolic action of being able to bring something to the Lord and lay it down before him and say, this is yours. But one of the things I love deeply is this ability to symbolically bring things before the Lord in prayer. I had to do this just two weeks ago. I was going through a list of my anxieties and my worries, and I, I began to journal some things out, and I began to journal out my grief of all the things that I felt I had lost and, and some of the things that I just wrote them down. And I'm like, okay, I'm trying to process through my grief. I'm trying to process through my anxiety, but now that I've written them down, what do I do with them? And so I began to talk to my wife, and I'm like, I don't know the next step. And she simply says, bring it up here when nobody else was at the building. I didn't know another way to symbolically do it better, and I just simply laid it at the feet of Jesus at the altar. I said, God, this, is, this all belongs to you. See, that's what it's saying in every situation. Whatever is worrying you, whatever is eating you up from the inside, whatever is giving you anxiety, he says, if you want to find peace, bring it to the Lord with prayer and petition. That word petition is underlined in my Bible. I thought that was a different word too, because I understand prayer. That's where I thank God for my food, and it's where I ask God to protect my family, and it's where I, you know, ask God, hey, please don't let me be caught for running this red light. All of my prayers, I understand. Whatever it is you're praying, we understand prayer. And then there's this word petition. Like, we know what a petition is, too. You see, a petition is where a group of people get together, and they all come together in agreement, and they're like, will you sign my petition? And sometimes you just walk by, and you're like, sure, I don't know what you're petitioning for, but yeah, I'm in agreement. And this idea of, of a community coming together for the power of change. You see, that's what communal prayer is. That's what the body of Christ should look like. When we come together in your life groups or as a body of Christ and say, listen, together we're going to stand in agreement. Together there's going to be change. Not because we're going to enact it, because the Holy Spirit is going to enact it through us. And it's so critical that we understand that prayer is not just an individualistic thing. It's also a communal thing. So when you're worried or when you're anxious, when was the last time you came together with your life group, with your community group? When was the last time you laid your anxieties before somebody else and said, hey guys, would you guys pray for the peace of God which transcends the understanding in my life too? Because we need that in one another. We need to remind each other of these things. And then he says we have to do this. Uh, I want to let you know this too. With don't be anxious about anything, but with everything, present your request to the Lord. I, I wanted to read to you today out of this research by psychologists, why we present it to the Lord, why giving it to God relieves our worries and anxieties. Some statistics that I wanted to share with you are this. 40% of the things we worry about will never happen. All of those things that go through, like, oh man, don't drop the table, like don't fall off the stage. All of the things I worry about when I get up here, I've never fallen off the stage yet. And, and it's like, why am I worried about that? Why do I consistently worry about that? And 40% of the things we worry about will never come to pass, and yet they eat us up, and they're not even a reality. Another 40% of the things we worry about, I'm oh, sorry, 30% of the things we worry about have already happened, meaning it's already reality. It's already happened. There's nothing you can do about it, and yet it continues to eat us away. Yeah, that's how it is in my life. It's like, oh, man, I'm so worried about it. And it's like, that's already happened. What are you going to do about it now? but it continues to eat us up. 22% of the things we worry about are trivial things. 4% of our worries are things we cannot change or have any impact on. And 4% of our worries are things that we can actually change. 4% are things that we can actually impact and change. My, my initial takeaway of this was, hey, even the things that I can change, it's not worth worrying about because I can do something about it. But... Then I realized that means that 96% of the things I worry about like, could be outside of my control. Either it's never going to happen, it's already happened, or there's nothing I can do about it. So what am I supposed to do? And that's why it's so critical to turn these things over to God. It's realizing that sometimes in life we are powerless in our situation. You want to know what's leading to our anxiety in 2020 is a feeling of powerlessness in the situation. 
When someone else is coming around and saying you can't do this or you have to do this and, and canceling all the things that you were planning on and anxiety is building up within us because we feel trapped. There's no fight, there's no flight, and so therefore we just have anxiety built within us. Paul says, what do you do? You simply have to trust in the Lord in all the things. And it's not just now, it's whatever may be eating you alive, you have to begin to present those requests to the Lord. I, I want to turn your attention to Jesus for a second. Isn't that a great thing to turn our attention to on Sunday mornings at church? Uh, and I don't want us to flip there, but do you remember when Jesus was facing the cross on his last night alive after the Last Supper? It says he went to the Garden of Gethsemane and he invited his community around to pray with him. And he says, guys, I am so heavy burdened right now. He goes, I am so anxious about what I'm about to face that I cannot face it alone. And so he got his closest disciples and he goes, please pray with me. And of course, they fell asleep on the job and didn't do it. But Jesus knew the power of petition. And he's like, I'm not going to pray alone. Like, even Jesus is like, I need to bring a community around me at this moment for my worry and my anxiety. Pray with me. And, and he prayed. And it says that he was so anxious that he began to sweat drops of blood. I've been anxious about things before. I have never once sweat blood. I have blood and I have sweat never together. And it says that Jesus was so burdened about this. And yet he brought it to the Lord, and he didn't just bring it once. He brought it three times to the Lord. And what that teaches us is, man, if you say, man, but I've prayed about my anxiety. I've prayed about the things that worry me. Have you done it again and again and again? There may be times you need to bring things to the Lord over and over and over with in the context of community. It's not a once and done thing. It's a continual relationship with God. You see, the reason God likes for us to bring things to him is because it opens up communication with him. I, I love the parable. We talked about this at, at the youth ministry life group this week as we talked about the parable of the unjust judge in Luke chapter something or other. I forgot where it was. That was Wednesday. And he says, listen, there was a woman who had a case before a judge and she went and she pled with him, but the judge was a jerk. And so he would not give her justice. And so she began to knock on his door every evening and every morning and every night, and she never left him alone. And finally, the judge says, I'm just going to give her what she wants because I'm annoyed. Like, she's never going to go away. He goes, it's causing me more anxiety just to keep this from her, so I'm just going to give her her judgment. And Jesus responded, if that's how an unjust, unloving judge feels about it, how much more so your loving father? Hey, see, that's a terrible strategy. I don't want my kids to know that, in that parable. Like, because then they'll be like, can we do this? No, can we do this? No, I've already told you no! But that's not the way our God feels about us. He says, no, 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 I want you to come to me. I want you to come to me. I want you to come to me. I want you to never stop coming to me about it. Come to me multiple times. Come to me with your friends. Come to me with your prayers and petitions. In every situation, whatever you're going through, bring it to me. Why? Because God says, listen, I want you to bring things to me because... There's nothing you can do about it, and I can give you peace. And the more time you spend with your Father in prayer, the less worry and anxiety these other things will bring into your life. So Paul says the way we do this is through prayer. The way we handle this is through prayer. And then he says, do it with thanksgiving. You see, have you ever noticed that people who are thankful just tend to be the most joyful, peaceful people you know? He says, hey, in the midst of your prayer, you need to be thankful for that which you had. We wrote it this way in your creek notes. Prayer is an obligation, not a, what did I say? Prayer is not an option, it's an obligation. Sorry, thanksgiving. Let me try that one more time. Thanksgiving is not an option, but an obligation. Thanksgiving is not an option, but an obligation. You see, he says, come to me with thankfulness. I, I shared a story this week there, there were a set of twins, and the father just noticed that they didn't seem to agree on anything. If one thought it was too hot, the other one thought it was too cold. If one thought it was too late, the other one thought it was too early. And they just never agreed on anything. But more than anything, he saw a difference in the way that one was always an optimist and one was always a pessimist. And so he figured, you know what, I wonder, I wonder how far I can push this. I wonder how far this goes. And so he went to the twin that was a pessimist, and he took all of their birthday presents that he was going to give the two of them, and he put them all in one son's room. 
He put them all in the pessimist's room. And in the optimist's rooms, he took a big pile of horse manure and just kind of put it on the floor in his room. And when they got back from dinner that night, he goes, hey guys, all of your presents are up in your room waiting for you. And he went up to see what was going on. And he walked into the room of the pessimist's son and he had all these presents and he looked at him and he goes, dad, he goes, think about how many batteries I'm going to need. Where am I going to store all this stuff? All my friends are going to be jealous of me. What am I going to do with all this stuff? And the dad was like, you got to be kidding me. He goes, still, he's like, there's no optimism in this. And he went into the second son's room and he was like dancing and singing around the pile of horse manure. And he goes, what are you so happy about? And the son looks at him and he goes, dad, with all this stuff, there's got to be a pony hidden somewhere in here. You see, it's about this perspective of gratitude. And I, it's about this uh, idea that the second son looks and he goes, but I know my father and I know he's a good man. And I know that I just walked into a room full of stuff in my floor. And he goes, but I know who my father is, and I know there's got to be someone good somewhere. And man, that's the kid I want to be when I come to my father. Like, that's the kid I want to be when I come to God with my prayers, not in a whiny way, but in a way of thanksgiving, because I know that God won't get tired of me. See, how do you do that? Because some of you have walked into rooms where there's just a big pile of manure waiting for you. Not literally, figuratively. How do you have this attitude of thanksgiving at all times? And I simply wrote this on your creek notes, and this is a sermon by itself, so I won't have time to get into it. We have to see our circumstances through the lens of God's love, his wisdom, and his power. We have to begin to see our circumstances through the lens of God's love, his wisdom, and his power. You see, when you understand the love that God has for you, the wisdom that he has, because sometimes we can look at God's plan and say, I don't know what you're doing, but if you keep in mind the wisdom that he has, that he does know what he's doing, and when you keep in mind his power, that no matter how powerless we feel in the midst of our worry or anxiety, God can handle it. And we have to keep that at the forefront of our minds and surrender it to the Lord. And finally, we wrote this. It's just an important thing to remember when you bring your prayers with thanksgiving to the Lord is there is nothing too great for God's power and there's nothing too small for God's care. There's nothing too great for God's power and there's nothing too small for dad's care. Because when we bring things to God, we're like, oh, I don't know what to do and you have to bring the big things to him and there's nothing too small that dad doesn't want to hear from you about it. And so he says, if you want to be able to go through the worry and anxiety, you want to find peace and joy even in the midst of it, how is your prayer life? Are you bringing the big things to the Lord? Are you bringing the small things to the Lord? Are you keeping in primary focus his love and his wisdom and his power? Are you coming with thankfulness? Because God says, I know that you don't know what you're doing, but I love you and I know how to get through this and I've got this. So trust me with it. And we'll find that this peace, and this is what he says next. He says, bring this, this prayer and petition with thanksgiving. Bring your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Then he says this, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think on such things. When he says, think on such things, he means set your mind on those things. And I almost went off on a tangent this week as I was beginning to prep this. I'm like, all right, let's talk about what is noble. Let's define what is right. Let's talk about what is pure. But I think this is actually just Paul in one of his ADD moments. He's like, all right, you want to know what you should think about? Think about whatever is pure. Think about whatever is right. Think about whatever is noble. Think about whatever is honorable. Just, just think about good things. Think about God things. You see, remember who God is and just dwell on him in your mind. And I think what he's simply saying is, hey, we should meditate on such things. We should give your attention to such things. And so I simply summed it up with it like this in your Creek Notes. Set your mind on joy. Set your mind on God's joy. He says, rejoice in the Lord. I'll say it again. Rejoice. And if worry will steal your joy, he goes, then think about the good. You see, here's the problem. You cannot will joy. And you cannot will peace. You see, joy is, is more than an emotion, but it's not less than an emotion. It's still an emotion. Peace is more than an emotion, but it's still an emotion. It's not less than an emotion. And you cannot will emotions. There is no angry switch. 
There is no happy switch. When you're down, you just can't flip that thing on and off and be like, I changed my mind. Like, I'm happy now. You can't, we don't have that kind of control over our emotions as human beings. But what we do have a lot more control over is our mind. And where your feelings follow your thoughts. You see, you have more control over your mind. You have control about what you think about. You have control over what you give your attention to. And your feelings tend to follow your thoughts. For example, and when I say your feelings follow your thoughts, just a quick example. Think of somebody right now that you hate. I know you shouldn't hate people, but let's do it anyway. Okay. If you think about somebody you really cannot stand, think about them for a second. And you dwell on that person. How long does it take before the anger begins to come? Before all of the hurt shows up in your heart? Before all of a sudden you've got anger, you've got hurt, you've got sadness? Welcome to Fellowship of Oso Creek. You're welcome. Just helping you dwell on the joy of the Lord today. In the same way, if we stop to think about like all of the fear around us, if you really stop to think about the anxiety, if you, if you dwell on the restrictions or on COVID-19, or if you think about the fact that there's an election in 2020, doesn't anxiety begin to creep up within you and make your heart race instantly? Like, like when you dwell on those things, you, your mind goes there, your feelings follow. And so what Paul is saying is he says, no, you have to think on the things that bring you hope, the things that bring you joy. You have to think about what's good and right because your feelings will follow your thoughts in the same way. If you stop and slow down enough to think about God and how good God is and how beautiful and wonderful and admirable the things that God has done in your life are, and if you dwell on who he is, he goes, you're going to find those emotions bringing themselves into line and you're going to find peace and you're going to find joy. And he goes, so dwell on those things. You see, the first thing that Paul lets us know is, how do we find joy and peace in the midst of our worry? And he says, we have to do it through prayer. Secondly, he says, you have to do it through your thoughts. And while you cannot control your emotions, you can control your thoughts. You, can, you decide what you meditate on, what you dwell on, what you think on. And he says, think of the good because your feelings follow your thoughts to peace and joy. You see, here's the thing. Happiness and unhappiness and joy and melancholy and worry and hope, they're self-perpetuating states of mind. Like, the more worried you are, the more worry will build up within you. The happier you are, the easier it is to think about happy things. When you're unhappy, it's actually difficult to stop your mind from going in that direction and stop it and turn it and bring it to a different direction. But it's what we have to do. We have to stop and meditate on the Lord, which is why he says, hey, you have to think on these things. Control your mind and do that. But it's a self-perpetuating state of mind. So when you are in a melancholic state of mind or when you are in an anxious state of mind, your mind keeps going in that direction. He goes, but if you can actually start to think about peace, it'll become easier for you. It's, it's like a pinwheel. I have a couple things that I want to show you for examples. This actually came to me last Wednesday when the youth were meeting outside, I realized that these thoughts, this idea of the self-perpetuating state of mind is kind of like a pinwheel. You know, a pinwheel just spins and does this. And I would blow on this, but you're really not supposed to do that right now. And so the wind starts to blow it and it starts to turn, you know, and it starts to turn faster and faster and faster. And once it gets turning, it just kind of keeps going on its own. In the same way, the wind blows the other way and it starts to turn and turn and turn and go faster and faster in that way. What actually brought my mind to this pinwheel was uh, last Wednesday when we were meeting with the youth outside on the playground, we brought a trash can out there because we were serving food and kids are messy. And so every time a kid would throw something away, the trash can lid would go up in the wind because we live in Corpus Christi, we'd catch the trash can lid and it would flip it faster and faster and faster. And this thing began to turn into this just never stopping whirly gig outside in the playground. So we started to play games and we're like, hey, do you think you can like throw your hot dog into the trash can, throw your trash in there? And like, and so can you get it in there or is it too, moving too fast? And every time we just flip the thing out and then flip the thing out and we made a big mess so we stopped playing that game. You see, it's this idea that when you start your mind thinking about joy, when you move it there, your emotions follow your thoughts. Your feelings follow your thoughts. And when you think about the things of the Lord, then suddenly peace begins to come and it becomes easier to do that. But when you find yourself going the other way, when you find yourself a worry, you actually have to kind of stop for a second. You bring it to the Lord in prayer. You bring it to your community in prayer. And you say, God, I'm surrendering this to you. And it's an intentional stopping. 
And then you bring your thoughts to him. And you say, God, help me to focus on what you're doing in my life. Help me to see the good. We call it silver lining in our society. But it's like, God, help me to meditate on what you are doing. And it actually stops the negative thoughts. And you intentionally bring them to the positive. But when you begin to move in that direction, it gets a little bit easier. Because I get that not all of us naturally move in the direction of peace and joy and, and lack of anxiety and happiness. Some of us just naturally tend to go this way. And I get that. There's a lot about body chemistry that's not in my area of expertise, which I won't talk about in brain chemistry. But I will say this. You have to begin to focus on intentionally stopping, bringing it to the Lord in prayer, and say, let me focus on the good things, and it gets easier and easier. And then he says, and it will guard your hearts and mind. And I think about how the kids were trying to throw kids. I was doing it. Um, we're trying to throw trash in this thing while it was moving and while it was just spinning and how every time it batted it out of the way. Because when you get to a place of peace, when you get to a place of joy in the midst of worry and those worrisome thoughts come, after a while it begins to guard your heart and mind. And when these other things come, it bats them away. And there's a peace of God and a peace with God and a peace from God. And it's this idea that it comes and it guards your hearts and it guards your mind. So Paul says, in the midst of our worry, how do we find joy and peace? It begins with bringing it to the Lord in prayer. And secondly, it, has to, it begins with bringing our thoughts to the Lord. We wrote this down too. Worry keeps us from appreciating what you do have. You see, worry keeps us from appreciating what you do have. When your mind starts to set in that direction, it will rob you of your joy. But if you stop and give it to the Lord, it sets another other way. I was reading a couple commentaries this week on Philippians chapter 4. And I found, came across this commentary from N.T. Wright. This is what he says in, on Philippians chapter 4. He says, The command in verse 8 to think about all of the wonderful and lovely things listed here runs directly opposite to the habit of mind instilled in us by the modern media. Read the newspapers. Their stock and trade is anything that is untrue, unholy, unjust, impure, ugly, of ill repute, vicious, and blameworthy. Is that a true representation of God's good and beautiful world? How are you going to celebrate the goodness of your creator if you feed your mind only on the place in which the world in which humans have made ugly? How are you going to take steps in your mind instead to fill it with all that God has given us to be legitimately pleased with, to enjoy, and to celebrate? And this question, I think, is a real question. He wasn't saying, man, how are we supposed to do this? It's a question that I think he's posing to each individual reader. If we set our mind only on the negative, what are you intentionally doing to set your mind on the positive? Because when he says, think about such things, in the Greek it means meditate on these things. Set your mind on joy. How are you going to intentionally take time and think about the good? How are you going to intentionally take time and pray to the Lord? Because if we just say to do it, but we don't make a plan to do it, it's probably not going to happen. What are you going to do this week to send your mind, center your mind on the things? And then we wrote this in your Creek Notes after that. We simply said this, take control of what you can and, what you, uh, and let go of what you can't. That's a good philosophy for life. Take control of what you can. Meaning if you can do something about it, do something about it. That verse that says God helps those who help themselves is not in Scripture. Okay, I want to be very clear about that. But... I have to believe that, man, when we set our thoughts and our minds to action in the Lord, say, God, I'm going to do what's possible. You do the impossible. Take control of what you can, like your thoughts. And that which you can't, you surrender to God through prayer. And it may take a lot of prayer. And then finally, he says this, and this is where we wrap up today. He says, whatever you have learned or received or heard in me or seen in me, put it into practice. Finally, we find joy and peace in the midst of worry through our actions. We find it through our prayers. We find it through our thoughts. And he says, then there's a practice. This is where it comes to take control of what you can and let go of what you can't. We practice this through our actions. You see, you have to move your body into practices of Jesus through action. Practices like Sabbath. Practices like feasting. Practices like community. Practices like worship. You have to intentionally come and set yourself and say, I'm actually going to do these things in my actions. 
You see, we pray to the Lord and say, God, I surrender this to you. We take control of our thoughts and we meditate and we pray to him and we say, God, take my thoughts. And then you take certain actions that he commands us to in scripture to bring us peace and to bring us joy. It's why we come together for worship on Sundays. Because in the midst of this, we need to be brought to action. And there has to be an actionable thing. It's the reason why when I mentioned I wrote down all my worries and my frustrations and my anxiety, I physically brought them up here and laid them before the altar of the Lord because there's something about putting it into practice and actually doing something in action which solidifies it because I could have just thought in my mind, God, it's yours. Put it down on the table. But you have to take action. So today I want you to be intentional. This week I want you to be intentional about bringing these things to the Lord through prayer. Because there's a lot of worry, there's a lot of anxiety, there's a lot of grief, and we all have it. And it's okay to have it because it's natural right now. And he says, but don't be that person. Be a person of joy and peace. And that requires intentionality. Through your prayers, through your thoughts, and through your actions. And what you're going to find is all of the pinwheel action that takes you in this direction. When you stop, when you Sabbath, when you rest... And when you intentionally bring your thoughts to the good and the Lord, when you intentionally pray to him, and when you intentionally make your body follow those thoughts and celebration and music and laughter and joy, you're going to find it to be easier and easier. It's like a pinwheel. And finally, we wrote this in your creek notes. Worry is not a sin. Living there is. Worry is not a sin. Living there is. So as we respond in worship today, as we stand, I just want to invite you to begin this process to, with prayer and with petition and worship and celebration, let us bring our concerns, our worries to the Lord and say, God, this is yours and I can't do anything about it, but you have all power. Let us dwell on his goodness as we sing and celebrate in action together. Will you stand as we pray? Father God, I thank you that you call us to be people of joy. I thank you that you call us to be people of peace. And Lord, I thank you that when we have worry and anxiety and these things eating us up inside, Lord, you don't come and judge us, but you empathize with us because we know your anxiety and your worry in the Garden of Gethsemane. But Lord, because of your death on the cross and your resurrection from the grave, there is nothing beyond your power and nothing beyond your care for us. So today, Lord, I simply pray that we would present our worries, our prayers, our petitions to you. We would surrender it to you and say, God, would you help change our thought pattern? God, would you help us practice these things you've told us to do? God, in the midst of this worry, in the midst of this anxiety, I actually ask that we would have this not only for our own peace, not only for our own joy, but Lord, we are in the midst of a city and a nation who feels so much of this anxiety and worry right now. And God, if we actually can figure out how to get through that and still have a peace of God which transcends their understanding, that they would see Christ in us and they would believe. Help us to be intentional of praying for one another, of bringing things to you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.